Hello everyone, and now we're going to come in for the applications. These are going to be fun. So, we've now covered all of the basics of it, and I'm now going to show you that stuff. there's stuff to do here. And so for our first application, I'm going to explain to you how I found those formulas for the Fourier transforms of chi q that we covered in episode 1. So now we can go over this. So, as we saw, chi q is not too q-adically continuous. Because of this, we cannot use our Riemann sum formula. This will not converge, it won't work at all. So, going by our motto though, shut up and compute, we will not let this deter us. To, since we can't compute it directly, we're, why not compute an approximation? And to that end, in my dissertation, I introduced the following terminology. For any integer n bigger than or equal to zero, I say write chi q n to denote this. I call this the nth truncation. So this is where we take our function and we precompose it with uh, the projection. More generally, for any PQ-adic function, I write Tn of f. This is the uh, Tn. This is the operator which sends f to its uh, nth truncation. And as there's an uh, an exercise in the uh, chapter on the Vanderput basis for that uh, uh, in ultrametric cal calculus in that book, there's a, has an exercise which wants to show that uh, the nth truncation is the locally constant function mod pn, which best approximates f, and this is true for any valued field. Now here's the fun part. Since the, uh, the truncation is locally constant, it's always going to be continuous, and therefore even if f is not, and so this is always going to be integrable. And moreover, we have the following. Uh, let f be any metrically complete valued field, and let, be, let f be any function. Then, as n approaches infinity, the nth truncation of f converges to s of f pointwise for all z. This is actually, we already proved this in showing the, conver the uh, uniform convergence of the Vanderput series. So, while we can't apply 2q-adic anal Fourier analysis to chi q, we can certainly do so to its nth truncation. And in particular, it might be interesting to see what happens if we consider uh, at letting n go to infinity. So to begin, we'll express chi q n at, in since locally constant. We can write it like this. It's a chi q of little n times the integrator functions. And so here, chi q of little n is a rational number. So this expression is a locally constant function with rational coefficients, which means we can do not only q-adic valued analysis, we can do complex valued analysis with this thing. We can treat this in any metric completion of Q and try and do analysis there. So in this case, this is fun. If we just consider this formula, this formula is the same both in terms of what it means, how it's defined, and what its value is. It is the same no matter what metric completion of Q we look at. This, is the, this integral is the same in the complex numbers as it is in the Q-adic numbers. And it's again, it's all by direct linear algebra. So here, the chi qn hat is the Fourier transform of chi q. We then use the, the locally constant representation. This thing right here, uh, we use our previous formula. This is, is this thing, and so we end up with the following. Chi qn hat is 1 over 2 times the, uh, uh, it's the average of chi q of n e to the negative 2 pi i n t over this interval if t is 2 is less than or equal to 2 to the n, and it is 0 everywhere else. So we can denote this nice, nicely using, a, uh, using the indicator function. 1, 0 is the indicator function of 0, so this thing will be equal to 1 whenever this element is 0 in z2 hat. Since t is a dyadic rational, its denominator is a power of 2, if the denominator, if the power of 2 in the denominator is uh, less than or equal to uh, n, this will evaluate to be an integer, which is congruent mod 1 to 0. So this thing will be equal to 1 if t's absolute, 2 adic absolute value is less than or equal to 2 to the n, and is equal to 0 otherwise. And so in this, we can then get this closed formula, a closed form expression for chi qn hat. <laughs> So uh, note that the specific, specific field, again, this field, the field that we choose to look at this in is, in, is independent of everything. The, right, we can do this in the algebraic numbers as currently written, but we can just as easily view this as happening in the complex numbers as we could in the q-adic complex numbers. So um, to get something useful out of this, 
we're going to nest them. We're going to do use our recursive method, and we're going to find a formula for chi q n hat in terms of chi q n minus 1 hat. And then doing this, we'll be able to unwind it to get a, a closed form expression for chi q n hat. So for doing the computations, it's useful to have the following notational shorthands. Uh, let alpha q of t, it's 1 plus q e to the negative 2 pi i t over 4. And let beta of t be e to the negative 2 pi i t over 4. Here t is the dyadic rational numbers in the unit interval. And so our first business is, the first order of business is to establish the closed form expression for this thing. And the expression is this. The chi q n hat of t is equal to 1 0 of 2 to the n t times alpha q of t times chi q uh, m hat n minus 1 of 2 t plus 1 0 of 2 t times beta of t, where n is bigger than or equal to 1, and here t, t is anything. And if we nest this, we then get the this explicit formula, which is it's the sum from n equals 0 to big N minus 1 of 1, 0 of 2 to the n plus 1 t times beta of 2 to the n t times the product from n, m equals 0 to n minus 1 of alpha q of 2 to the m t. Uh, we're going to, in all cases, whenever our, the upper limit of, of a product is less than the lower limit, we define the product to be 1, just like whenever the upper limit of a sum is less than the lower limit, we define the sum to be equal to 0. So, so the proof here, fit, we, and like everything else we're going to do, it boils down to using chi q's functional equations. Writing it out the definition of chi, we're writing out chi q uh, n hat, we're going, then going to split this sum mod 2. So we're going to break uh, n into the evens and the odds, and that reduces the exponent of n of, of 2 here by 1. We then factor out the, what these have in common, which is e to the negative 2 pi i 2n. Now we use the functional equations on these things. We get 1 half and q plus 1 over 2. Now we then uh, rewrite this and collect terms around chi q of n. So we get 1 half plus q e to the negative 2 pi i t over 2. This is um, 2 times alpha. Alpha, again, we define it to have 4 in the denominator. So this is 2 times alpha. And likewise, beta, we define it to have 4 in the denominator. So this is 2 times beta. And so we get using alpha, alpha and beta, 1, 0 of 2 to the n t over 2 to the n times the sum of 2 alpha q of t chi q of n plus 2 beta of t and e to the negative 2 pi i n of 2 t. So we can, uh, here we're going to bring out uh, chi q n minus 1 hat by distributing the sum. And so this thing right here is, note that this is going to be chi q n minus 1 hat of 2 t. And then we have this expression right here. Uh, so to deal with this uh, uh, remaining sum here, we're just going to sum out the geometric series explicitly. If t's denominator is at most 2, then 2t two is going to be an integer, and so this is all going to be 1, and we get 2 to the n minus 1, uh, uh, minus 1 copies, uh, plus 1 copies of 1, so this is 2 to the big n minus 1, and that's 1. On the other hand, if t's denominator is at least 4, then this is going to be a, a non-integer root of, a root, it's going to be a root of unity other than 1, and so the geometric series applies, and then this becomes uh, 1 minus 1, so it's 0. So this is, is 1 if t's denominator is at most 2, and is 0 if t's denominator is greater than or equal to 4. And so this sum simplifies to bold 1, 0 of 2t. And so that's uh, computing the recursive relation. Now here, just note something uh, that chi q n minus 1 hat, this is supported if tau has a denominator at most 2 to the n minus 1. Thus, this thing will be supported for when 2t is less than or equal to 2 to the n minus 1. The 2 attic absolute value of 2 is 1 half, so multiplying on 1 half by both sides, we get that this will be non-zero when t's denominator is at most 2 to the big N. So we can keep track of that by multiplying by the indicator function there. That is, this is true. And then putting everything together, we get the recursive formula. Deriving the, uh, cl uh, the closed form expression is just a matter of nesting it. So take this thing, then I uh, plug it, use it to plug it for itself, and so on and so forth, and then we notice the pattern. And yes. 
And then so finally, we to do this to finish this off, we just need to compute the case where big N is equal to 1. And then doing that in closed form, we get that this is this. So it's chi q of 0 plus chi q of 1 e to the negative 2 pi i t, which is 0 plus 1 half e to the negative 2 pi i t, which is 1 0 of 2 t beta t. And then plugging this in, we get what we want, and we're done. <laughs> so uh, we've done all of this. Because chi q is not too q adically integrable, we know that this Fourier transform of its nth truncation will not converge q adically as n goes to infinity. Uh, when I was doing this, it would, I would be thinking, well, if that's the case, it would be nice to get a clear demonstration of exactly how this divergence or non-convergence occurs. Unfortunately, this is kind of messy, and it, it, it doesn't really help, and it's not even appealing to look at. So to fix this, what we need to do is examine carefully what happens as we increase n. And the idea comes from the following observation. So recall that uh, a, uh, alpha q of t, we define that as, where is it? as this thing. So when, alpha, when t is an integer, this is going to be equal to q plus 1 over 4. We can, we can uh, run with that. So let, instead of considering alpha q of t, what if we consider alpha q of 2 to the m t? Well, if this is an integer, meaning if t's denominator is at most 2 to the m, this is going to simplify to alpha q of 0, because alpha q is 1 periodic, and which is going to be equal to q plus 1 over 4. What does it mean for uh, t's denominator to be at most 2 to the m? Well, the denominator of t is 2 to the power of negative v2 of t. That's the exponent of 2 in the denominator of t. So the requirement that this is an integer is the same thing as saying that m is at least as large as the negative valuation of t. So what, what can we do with this? Well, let's go back here and just look at the formula we got. As big N goes to infinity, little n will get to range over increasingly large values. So here, for a fixed t, as we consider further and further terms, the, the number of the m is going to get arbitrarily large in this sum. However, because t is a fixed dyadic rational, 2 to the m, will once m is big enough, will eventually make t into an integer. And once we hit a value of m, which makes 2 to the m t into an integer, 2 to the m t will be an integer for all sufficiently larger values of m. So what this actually shows is that if we pick n, in particular the, the key value of m is this thing right here, so once we have n reach negative v2 of t, instead the, ser the product starts growing geometrically with respect to n. So the product of alpha q of 2 to the m t from m equals 0 to n minus 1 well, first, we're going to multiply from m equals 0 all the way up to m equals negative v2 of t minus 1. But once m is equal to negative v2 of t, alpha q of this will just be alpha q of 0, and the term after that, and the term after that, and the term after that. So for each fixed t, uh, as n, well, 1 and n bigger than negative v2 over t, v2 of t, and here uh, t is non-zero, we have that this occurs. So notice that this is going to be the key exponent, and when q is equal to 3, this thing is equal to 1, and so it stops growing entirely. Whereas when q is greater than 3, this is going to be uh, growing geometrically. So what we're, what we're doing here is we're taking this thing where we have, uh, where n is the variable that we allow to vary, and uh, then t is, is fixed. We're going to reverse the dependence of n and t. We're going to untangle it. And in particular, what we're going to do is we're going to liberate the part of this sum which is uh, independent of big N. <clears throat> and what it's going to be by using this observation, because note that this product right here, this is not going to change as N changes. Only this thing is. So we can extract this to get something useful. In, now also, when T is zero, this product here becomes this. And so if with a bit of thought, we can actually take care of these all in one go. And it's like this. n plus the minimum of 0 and v2 of t. So when t is non-zero, v2 of t is going to be a negative integer because t is a dyadic rational. 
So when t is non-zero, this minimum, it just is v2 of t. So this thing agrees with this thing when t is non-zero. When t is zero, on the other hand, by definition, the two-adic valuation of zero is positive infinity. And so the minimum of zero and positive infinity is zero. And so when t is zero, this becomes just n. Likewise, when t is zero, uh, we define this to be, we'll, still, we'll define this to be one when t is zero, because then technically this would become negative one times positive infinity, which by our convention would make this one. So this formula works for both uh, zero, t equals zero and non-zero t. At this point, introducing the function a q hat from episode one is perfectly natural. This is a q hat. It is one when t equals zero, and it's this product for other t. And so with a q hat in hand, we can massage uh, our explicit formula uh, here, and we can pull out the terms that do not grow as big N grows. And we're going to do that here. This is the big untangling. The main proposition is this. Uh, this uh, messy term over here, we're going to characterize it fully based on the behavior of N and M. So 1, 0 of 2 to the N plus 1 T, beta of 2 to the N T times this product here. This is going to be 0 if 1 is less than or equal to n, is less than or equal to negative v2 of t minus 2, it's going to be a q of hat of t over q minus 1 if n is equal to negative v2 of t minus 1, and it's going to be this uh, geometric term we saw here when uh, n is greater than or equal to negative v2 of t. So the proof, uh, let t be non-zero and suppose at little n is bigger than uh, 1. We just start with our formula, and then we're going to work up with the summand on a case-by-case -case basis. Let's first start with this case. Suppose n is at least as big as negative v2 of t. Then the m product here will uh, is going to be is going to be is going to contain a q hat of t because he, here n is going to be at least as big as this. So when t is non-zero and n is greater than or equal to negative v2 of t. We're going to first have a q hat of t, which is everything we get when m is from 0 to negative v2 of t minus 1, and then we're going to have the remainder. But this, again, by what we saw, because m is big, this is going to be a q alpha q of 0, which is just q plus 1 over 4, so this is a constant. Uh, the, uh, where does the 1 of 1 fourth come from? It comes from beta. Writing beta equals of 2 to the n t is equal to this, since n is bigger than the valuation of t, of t this 2 to, the, 2 to the n t is going to be an integer, so this is just 1 fourth. So when t is not equal to 0, we get this. Now, uh, uh, what happens here? Uh, uh, note that uh, when n is negative v2 of t, this is still going to have a bigger denominator. Uh, this here will have 1 power of t, 1 power of 2 more than in the denominator of t. So this is going to be equal to 0, which makes this 1. Likewise, if we make n bigger, it's still going to be equal to 1. So this indicator function disappears. Next, suppose n is equal to negative v2 of t minus 1. Well, let's plug everything in. Here we get this is 2 to the negative v2 of t. 2 to the negative v2 of t is exactly the denominator of t. So this is an integer on the inside, which means this whole thing is 1. Likewise, we get this. So we can make alpha q hat of t appear by multiplying and dividing by uh, this term right here. And gets us as follows. Now, by def now since t is non-zero, this is the two-attic absolute value of t. And so here's where the two-atticness comes important. This thing is t times a the two adic absolute value of t over two. Since uh, t this since t is non-zero, it's a rational number of the form k over two to the n, where k is a positive odd integer. So t times the two adic absolute value, this is just going to be some positive odd integer over two. However, beta is a function on z two hat, which means it's one periodic. And so more generally, for any one periodic function. Uh, uh, phi hat uh, on uh, z2 hat, the one periodicity tells us that for any non-zero t, this is going to be of the form k over uh, k over 2, which is always just going to be 1. 
Um, in fact, I believe right here, this is, uh, I, I don't want to say his name because he was a Nazi, so I call it the Landau character rather than the you-know-who character, but this is the you-know-who character uh, in, in action from the piatic analysis and from wit vectors. This is the uh, projection onto the finite field with, uh, with uh, the non-zero elements of the finite field, in this case with two elements. And so notice that when, uh, uh, the, the if instead of two addicts, we were working with the p addicts, we would have multiple different values for this depending on the projection of t's numerator into the finite field with, with uh, p elements. However, because we are working over the two addicts, this simplifies to just a constant. And that constant is beta of one half over alpha q of one half, which we work through it, it's one over q minus one. So when n is equal to negative v2 of t minus one, this is equal to a q hat of t over q minus one. Finally, suppose n is less than or equal to negative v2 of t minus two. Then, since n plus 1 is at most this, and since this has 1 power of 2 less than the power of 2 in the denominator of t, this is not going to be an integer when n is in this range. So this means this indicator function is 0, and so the whole thing disappears. So combining everything that we've done, we then get this formula. And this is the untangling. Now notice, this is very nice compared to this. This is very ugly, but this is very nice. And this is the magic that we need to make everything work. With this, we then have what I, the following a tau. He likes to call the fine structure when he was working with the Syracuse random variables. This gives us the fine structure decomposition of chi q uh, n hat of t. And so, for the, which is as follows. For each big N greater than or equal to 1, and for all uh, t in z2 hat, we have the following. Chi 3n hat of t minus 1 0 of 2 to the n minus 1 t times n over 4 times a3 hat of t is this. And likewise, we get something over here if q is equal to 3, where here fn is this weird function thing here. And this thing indicate means that this needs to be equal to this quantity when t has is in this range and is 0 for all other t. Uh, now, just before we do anything with this, it's worth looking at what it, what it really is meaning. What we've done is we've gone from this messy, messy looking uh, closed form expression, and what we've done is we've basically computed its as an asymptotic expansion, an exact asymptotic expansion. This is the full function, and this is the divergent term, and this is the calm underneath the storm when we subtract off the divergent term. Likewise, the same thing is here. As we saw with that q plus 1 over 4, when q, when q is equal to 3, this, uh, the geometric series uh, uh, degenerates, and instead it grows uh, linearly with the number of terms, whereas in, when q is greater than or equal to 5, the geometric series grows geometrically in the number of terms. And here, this is chi, q, chi 3 hat, and this right here is chi q hat. What, what, how, the way we'll, that I got chi q hat from this is I saw that for fixed t, if we let n go to infinity, this stuff here disappears, as does this stuff, and we're just left with this function and that function. And so that it's the, this is the constant term with respect to fixed t of this asymptotic expansion as n goes to infinity. So here we just, uh, we're going to first adopt the notation a q n hat of t. Uh, the, what this differs at is a q hat without the little n, that has an upper limit on the product here. But when uh, without with the little n, we have no upper limit. And so with this convention, we can then write this thing a little bit more neatly as beta of 2 to the n t times a q n hat. From here, the proof is just one big computation. The idea at, at work is to apply are uh, untangling in uh, here so as to decompose this into a part that depends only on t and that and a part that depends only on n. The the schematic of what we're going to get is then as follows: chi q hat n of t. It's going to be something which depends on n and t, a function that depends only on t and that is valid when t's denominator is at most two to the n and something that depends on t and that is uh, non-zero 
only when t's denominator is exactly 2 to the n. So as n goes to infinity, this thing will disappear, this thing will diverge, but this will converge pointwise. So now letting t be non-zero and be in the uh, support of this function, we're going to use our untangling. So what happens here? We've used the fact that a q hat qn hat is going to be zero whenever n is less than or equal to that thing, which is what we saw from our untangling proposition. So the only n's that matter are these over here. So now it just depends on the, on the value of the upper bound. So suppose that big N is exactly uh, negative V2 of N. Then big N is, is, again, it's like this, and so we just work through the details write this out, this is just one term, by, by definition, this thing is this, and then we write it here, and we uh, multiply and divide by alpha, so that we can get this is going to be a q hat of t, and we have this, and so it's exactly like what we saw before, the, uh, uh, the Landau character comes into projection, comes into play, and so this is a constant, and we get 1 over q minus 1 times alpha q times a q hat of t, Case two, suppose t is between 0 and 2 to the n in its absolute value, then this is the same thing as saying that this number is strictly less than this number, and so that 2 to the little n t is always going to be an integer for n in this range. And so now our 6.78, which is this guy, becomes here. So we, again, we plug it, we're going to pull out the term where big n or where little n is equal to this thing, and then we have all the uh, terms that come past it. Since 2 to the n t is going to be an integer for all n bigger than the, num the exponent of 2 in the denominator of t, this is just going to be beta of 0, and we can pull it out. And likewise, by using our multiplication trick, we got this. As we saw before, this is 1 over q minus 1, and what we're left with is here. So by Proposition 46, our untangling, this thing, when n is bigger than or equal to negative v2 of t, it's this geometric term times this. And so we've now completed the untangling. Now we just re-index, and then we just sum the two different cases. So what I've done here is I have a, 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 increased, a, a decreased n here by negative v2 of t to uh, add a v2 of t. Uh, to add a negative v2 of t here to get rid of that. This a q hat of t can be factored out, and so then we get two possibilities based on whether q plus 1 over 4 is equal to 1, or based on whether it's not equal to 1. And then just summing the geometric series, we get this. And so, boom. And notice the range of this. Finally, let's suppose t is equal to 0. Then Every, we, uh, everything becomes zero. By definition, this is zero, zero. This is q plus one over four. And so then that's a geometric series if q is bigger than or equal to five and it's linear if q is three. And so everything comes together and we get this. Finally, because chi q n hat of t vanishes when t is denominator bigger than two to the n, we then get this nice summary when q equals three. And we get this nice summary when q is greater than or equal to 5. So now all we, uh, I could have just written this as the fine structure formula, but it's a little bit neater in the other version. And to conclude for this, all we notice that is n over 4 here is present when t is in this range. And this range of t has this as its indicator function. So if we subtract off this term from this range of t, that kills this and that kills that. And so we get this. Likewise here, we're going to be doing the same range, but instead we're going to be subtracting off, uh, uh, this one's a bit more uh, uh, tricky, we're going to be subtracting off this, uh, this over this times this, ignoring the negative one. And so I'm subtracting this off, and, and this time it's going to be for all, to t from zero up to, uh, two, to the, uh, 2 to the n. Let you know, this thing is, uh, this thing is, uh, we're subtracting just, we're going to first kill the, uh, this constant term, and then we're going to deal with the rest of it. So first, this is subtracts off the term at zero to kill that, and now we subtract this thing. So what do the indicator functions tell us? This function is going to be one if t is non-zero, 
and if t is zero, this is going to be one. So if t is zero, this is zero. And this is well, this is going to be, so this is supported when t is bigger than zero, but has a denominator at most to the big N minus one. And subtracting that off will only take away the term here. And that gives us this, where Fn is the sum of this thing and that thing. And we're done. And so this is the, the, the fine structure lurking beneath the tumult. Okay, yes. So, using uh, chi q hat of t, we can finally answer a question that I imagine a lot of you have been pondering right now. What actually is chi q? That is to say, we've, with all this PQ analysis that we've done, where is it? What is it? How does it fit in? And the answer is that it's a measure. Particularly, the formula where we take, uh, it's again, the Parseval Plancherel identity, which we use to construct our measures. We take a function f, and then we're going to map it to the sum of f hat of t times chi q hat of, of negative t. This is a 2q adic measure, which I'm going to denote by chi q of z dz. And so by definition, this is that. So although we have not yet dealt with the algebraic number theory needed to rigorously make sense of this expression, uh, showing that chi q is a measure doesn't require anything that complicated. All we need to know is that since e to the 2 pi i t is a root of unity, it has a q adic absolute value of 1. And so by the ultrametric inequality, since q is an odd prime here, this has the same absolute value as this. And so this has an absolute value of 1, but this has an absolute value of 1 over q because it's a multiple of q, and so the ultrametric inequality tells us that 1 wins, and this has an absolute value of 1. And so as I mentioned in episode 1, the q adic absolute value of a q hat is always 1. Likewise, v2 of t, that's always going to that's gonna be a, a, an integer when t is non-zero, and all of the integers are q adically bounded. They have an absolute value at most 1. And so from this and from our formulas, we see that uh, this the q, chi q hat has a bound is bounded in q adic absolute value regardless of whether q is equal to three or greater than or equal to five. And so by our formula, it's bounded, and so this will then converge in in c q for any uh, continuous function q to q adic function f because such a function has a Fourier transform f hat that decays to zero. So it's a measure. And what's interesting about this is, and we'll, we'll see this more of this in uh, episode five, is that really the way to think about it is chi q of z is the radon nicodeum derivative of this measure here. And what's really fun about that is because, once again, according to the Dutch non-Archimedean school, there's no such thing as the non-Archimedean uh, Regidon Nicodemus theorem in the, in uh, P, the PQ attic context, but of course, what I've shown is that it is. And indeed, in the next in episode five, one of the things we're going to talk about is Hardy Littlewood maximal functions. Yay! So now another application: doing what Tau did. So I was writing this up uh, just earlier this afternoon, uh, just because I wanted to first summarize the details. But then, as I did it, I discovered something really cool. So that took up my whole afternoon. <clears throat> So because we also covered the analysis of complex-valued functions of a p-adic integer variable, let's use what we've done so far to work out the details of how uh, this Newman formalism can be used to reformulate Tau's 2019 results. In particular, we're going to show the following. Let chi be a q-adic integer-valued rising continuous function of a p-adic integer vari variable. Then uh, chi is a q-adic integer-valued random variable, on the probability space we get by equipping the p-adic integers with its real-valued Haar probability measure. Specifically, given any positive integer n and given any q-adic integer uh, uh, a, I write that the probability of chi being congruent to a mod q to the n, I define this as the uh, p-adic Haar probability measure of the pre-image of this set under chi. More generally, the events associated to chi will be Borel subsets of Zp. Okay, so for this, I just have to open everyone's uh, minds up again. So in probability theory, when we talk, like let's consider a, a throw of a dice. The events in that case, obviously, 
are the possibilities that the dice can produce. The, prob the one event is that we roll a one. Another event is that we roll an even number. Another event is that we roll a, uh, roll a six, etc., or that the sum of our roll is equal to four, and so on. However, that's actually an abuse of terminology. If you look under the floorboards and, and open up the, uh, the toolbox, the definition uh, in the Kolmogorov axiomatization of probability theory, the definition of an event is that it is a s measurable subset of the sample space and that a random variable is a function from the sample space to the reals or the complexes. So the in, par in, in uh, probability parlance, Everyone, although we talk about events as being outcome values taken by the random variable, in truth, the event is the subset of the sample space. So if the actual event in, say, the dice throw is even, is the set of dice throws where the, out, where the ones we get is even. So in this case, the, uh, the events we're getting at are going to be Borel subsets of, uh, Z, of ZP, where this should be a P. And uh, remember, a Borel set is one that's generated by unions of, of open sets and intersections of closed sets and complements. So given any Borel subset of, the, of ZQ, the output, where we equip ZQ with the q adic topology, the probability that chi is in E is then defined as the Haar measure of chi's preimage of E, and then we get that this function, e to the negative 2 pi i t chi of z dz, is the characteristic function of chi. Here, the integral is the real-valued Haar probability measure, and t is in zq hat. And in particular, we have the discrete Fourier transform identity, which is that the probability that chi is congruent to a mod q to the n is 1 over q to the n times the sum of t, with denominators at most q to the n, Phi, uh, 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 phi chi of t times e to the 2 pi i t a. So to prove all of this, we need to show that, first of all, we're going to use this thing to show it. And to, what we need to show in particular is that this integral actually makes sense. Uh, the way we, to, way we need to just recall that you can define the integral of any bounded measurable function. So we need to prove that this function is me that this function is measurable. And to do this, what we're going to show is that chi is measurable. By the, I mean, specifically, I mean the following: given any Borel set in the Q adic integers, let's call that Borel set E, the preimage of E under chi is then going to be a uh, set. Is again going to be a measure? Is a Borel set of the P adic integers. In particular, it's going to be a measurable set. Where the, of the p-adic integers, where the measure I'm referring to is the Haar measure. And so, in fact, we're going to prove the, more generally that any rising continuous function is measurable in, the, in this sense. In particular, so make zp into a measure space by equipping it with its real-valued Haar probability measure, and uh, make qq into a measure space by equipping it with its real-valued Haar probability measure, where it's the probability measure on zq. We're going to give them the uh, sigma algebras of their Borel sets. The sigma algebra means it's, an, it's closed, undercountable unions, uh, intersections, and, comp and complements. Then, as a function from the measure space ZP to the measure space QQ, our uh, chi, our rising continuous function, is measurable. So, the proof. This is going to use the topological characterization of rising continuity that we saw back in episode, in, saw back in episode uh, three. What this said is that if U, that the, the, if U is an open subset of QQ, chi, or V is an open subset, then chi inverse of V, because chi is rising continuous, it's going to be generated by uh, the uh, open the open standard open subsets of ZP, the the singletons containing the non-negative integers, <clears throat> and the single and sets containing a non a second sets containing a p-adic integer with infinitely many digits, as well as its projections mod p to the n for all sufficiently val large values of n. So, in particular, since, uh, since the Borel sigma algebra on QQ is generated by the open sets, 
It's to, to prove that chi is measurable. It suffices to show that chi inverse of v is measurable for every open set. Since chi is rising, rising continuous, this is going to be expressible in terms of the three types of sets which generate the rising topology. And all of those sets are measurable sets with respect to the Haar measure. And therefore, uh, uh, their, the unions and intersections and complements are going to be measurable and everything's measurable and so we're done. <coughs> Uh, also, like with our work on the rising topology, this result can be shown to hold for F, where F is any metric complete, complete valued field, with a caveat that if F is not Archimedean, its residue field must have characteristic not equal to P. <coughs> so, uh, this tells us that chi is measurable. So, uh, since the character here, this is a, a, a character of this locally compacted Billion group, this is a continuous function, and so it's going to be a measurable function. So, we have one measurable function composed with another measurable function, which is also measurable. And so this thing is measurable. Since this is a measurable function, which is bounded in complex absolute value, it's real and in particular, it's real and imaginary parts are bounded. That means that this integral exists by basic theory from Lebesgue uh, integration. <clears throat> so then what we're going to do is letting n be greater than or equal to one and letting a, b, and z cube. We'll just compute the sum directly. Everything's finite, so we can just interchange. And this, using our Fourier uh, series for the indicator function, this is just the indicator function for this uh, for chi z is congruent to a mod q to the n. And by definition, this is the measure of the uh, set of uh, in zp that chi maps into this set. And so that's by definition this. So, and then finally, in dealing with events, since chi is measurable, this formula is the measure induced by uh, chi because here mu is the part of the hard measure, and that proves our theorem. So in this way, all integer val q adic integer value rising continuous functions give rise to probability theory, and we can use all of the methods. In fact, as for just as fun, we get these using a Parseval Plancherel, we get an energy condition, uh, an L an L two condition. Which is that the uh, L two av, and again, this is the uh, this is specifically the uh, the complex absolute values, and th this should be an infinity, but whatever. So this is the average of this absolute value is equal to the sum of the squares of the probabilities, and the proof is standard. Take the absolute value squared; it's the uh, function times its conjugate. Distribute the conjugation with the integral, and then write this, and we get this using our indicator function formula, which is this. Now we note that this is a partition of unity for any uh, for any x in ZP. Chi of x is going to be congruent mod q to the n to a k in this range. So we can write this. And when these two inter, uh, two brackets interact, this forces this thing to be equal to k. So we can then separate them and, and uh, intertwine the integrals. These are uh, the same integral, but just with a ch dummy change of variables. This is the probability that chi is congruent to k mod q to the n squared. And then we uh, divide by, uh, well, whoopsies, uh, just earlier, this should, be a, a, this should be a q here. This should be a q, 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 q. And then divide and we get the result. <laughs> now here's the interesting thing that I discovered. <clears throat> Note that we can get a kind of natural way to define the expected value of chi like so. Let's define en of chi. Well, this is going to be the, ex the expected value of if we restrict chi to, to looking at its values mod q to the n. I'm pretty sure this can be written as a, uh, as a uh, conditional expectation, but, 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 I'm, but I suck at probability theory, so don't take my word for it. But if someone could show it, that'd be great. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use our uh, discrete Fourier transform identity to rewrite this thing. So when we're going to interchange the k and the t, and we get this. This sum, well, if we just note this standard uh, power series identity, this is a sum from k equals 0 to q to the n minus 1 of kx to the k, we get this if x is equal to 1, and this for all other x. Now, so when t has a denominator at most q to the n, look what happens. Uh, e to the 2 pi i q to the nt, well, since that this condition means q to the nt is an integer, so this thing is 1. So when we do this, uh, this, this guy dies, this guy dies, and so we're left with this thing. But look, this is 
if we add this here, we get q to the n e to the 2 pi i t minus q to the n. And so we end up with this thing. Now let's divide by q to the n. And so then we get the following formula. Um, now, here's the fun part. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, and as Tao himself showed, it can uh, when we have the specific case of chi q, it can be shown that this probability is always going to be a rational number. In particular, its, uh, its denominator is going to be, uh, actually no, just be, it's going to be a rational number for all n and k. And so because of that, this quantity is a rational number for all n. In particular, that means that we can consider what happens as n goes to infinity with respect to any metric completion. To that end, it would be very interesting if someone could show that this expected values limit converges q adequately to some number. Now, this is very tantalizing because it gives a connection with something completely unexpected, which is the following. So, look at this formula here. This is a finite number of, comp of additions and multiplications involving algebraic numbers, integers, and roots of unity. This thing right here, it will make sense over any valued field, provided that the residue characteristic thing works out. So this identity is, again, universal with respect to our valued fields. So that tells us that something weird is going on. First of all, uh, much like what we did just previously with chi q, we can rewrite this and, and to re, uh, free the dependence of this thing. So this is as one formula. And so what we have here in particular is that this limit converges in the discrete topology. <clears throat> and for any, so in particular, so what this says here is that, this, is that if t is zero, this is this. And what, to make this work, all we need is for n to be at least as large as the power of p, of uh, this should be the uh, it should be a Q, is the power of Q in the denominator of T. And so what that tells us is that this identity, this limit, converges in the discrete topology, and so it will convert on the, on the algebraic numbers. And because of that, it will converge pointwise with respect to T in any metric completion of Q bar. We could choose the complex numbers as, as, as the uh, limit, uh, as the metric completion, but because chi Q outputs Q adic numbers, this suggests we should consider what happens in the q adic complex numbers, the metric completion of the algebraic closure of the q adic rationals. In this case, by definition, this thing converges because it converges in finitely many steps. The, and so this is by definition of what this integral is. Literally, this is the definition of the Vulcan-born integral of this function. Uh, the Vulcan-born integral is a famous example of a, in this case, a q q adic integral, meaning that it's a function that takes q adic values and is of a q adic variable. This is very famous mostly because the integral of z to the n is going to be equal to the nth Bernoulli number, and that for fact holds true no matter what q you pick. So the by definition, the Vulcan-born integral of a function is the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over q times a k equals 0 to k, uh, q to the n minus 1 of f of, of f of k. It's the limit of the Riemann sum. What makes this thing weird is that unlike all of the analysis we've done in the rest of this episode, this integral is not translation invariant. That is to say, if I replace if I replace this with z plus one and z plus one, the result would change. And this is something that is guaranteed to happen in q q adic analysis when q is uh, not infinity. And it's due to the fact it's easily easy to show that the only continuous translation invariant linear functional on the space of continuous q q adic functions is the zero map. And so this integral is a Vulcan-born integral, which means that although we started out by working with, in, in this formula, we started out by working with rational numbers, we can make the limit exist q adically. This suggests that um, we should be able to, with, uh, for chi q, take this formula and make sense of it as n goes to infinity in the q adic context. So the value, and, the, the, and Doing so would then allow us to work with chi q 
as a truly non-Archimedean valued random variable. In the setup we have here, even though chi takes uh, values in the q addicts, our probabilities are not measuring uh, a random interval, any particular random interval, uh, intervals, but we're considering the probabilities that it takes values in a certain set. So, what, in other words, what's the idea is as n goes to infinity, we should be able to get the uh, 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 we localize the measure just like you do in in, in ordinary real value probability theory, but in this case, it's non-Archimedean, it's Q-adic value, and so it's really interesting to see if we can take these relationships and extend them to there, because non-Archimedean of, of probability theory, by which I mean probabilities taking values in non-Archimedean spaces is, is very weird and very new. So that's quite exciting, and that the Vulcan-born integral appears, and it would be this would be a wonderful thing to do for future research. And so it might be possible to make sense of that in that context. Moreover, and also, so the uh, Vulcan-born integral is an example of what's known in number theory as a Q-adic distribution. These were studied in great detail by Yvette Amis in her dissertation work. I think... Well, I want to say it was in the 70s, but I don't remember exactly. Anyhow, I've never seen the Vulcan-born integral appear anywhere outside of the, oh, it's just this cool, cute thing that we can do in a piatic analysis that seems to have no application anywhere other than it produces the Bernoulli numbers. <clears throat> but, all, but also, uh, the uh, actually, you know, there is one thing, is that the uh, theory of translation of, uh, P -ad of piatic distributions, that is used to define... Uh, uh, the L the L, L functions in a p-adic context, <clears throat> and that gets into class field theory. And so now the last example I want to go over is p-q-adic differentiation. So one of the reasons I have been simping so hard for mindless computation in this episode is, and my work in general, is because while doing my PhD dissertation, I discovered an identity which made me incredibly angry. Why did it make me incredibly angry? Because a high school student could have figured it out. And once that was done, anyone with even an ounce of imagination in their head should have been able to realize the implications. So here's the fall. Here's the identity that angers me. It's this. If we, it's the Fourier series generated by VP of T is this. It's P times the uh, sum of the P attic at one over the P attic absolute value of Z minus one over P minus one. This holds for all non-zero p-adic integers, z, and it holds whenever big N is at least as large as the p-adic valuation of z. So proof, let z be non-zero. So we know that for any integer n greater than or equal to 1, vp of t is equal to negative n if and only if t's denominator is p to the n. So we do our level set decomposition. We sum this from... Uh, uh, n equals 1 to big N, the sum over T, P, P equals P to the N. We then use our Ramanujan sum identity, and we get this thing. Simplifying gives this formula, which, we, which is one of the cases of the identity that we proved in episode 1. Now, let Z be, since Z is non-zero, we can write it as P to the valuation of Z times U, where U is a, a unit of, of ZP. It's a multiplicatively invertible p integer. It, it has an absolute value of 1. In particular, what this then tells us is that the largest the power of p we can get out of z is p to the vp of z. So when n is bigger than this number, this congruence cannot happen. So in this sum right here, all of these terms will die for n greater than or equal to vp of z plus 1. And so we get this. And here, all we need is for n to be bigger than that. <laughs> so our, and also note that our choice of n guarantees that this bracket vanishes, because this can only happen if n is at least as large, is no bigger than vp of z. Taking big N to be bigger than vp of z makes this go away. Finally, here, well, since n is less than vp of z, this is automatically going to be true. So this disappears and becomes 1, and then we get a geometric series. And then just note that this is P times the reciprocal of the p-adic absolute value of Z. We get this. Nice. Really simple. Rearranging it, raising, rearranging this gives us this. And again, the, con uh, the convergence here is with respect to the discrete topology, and so in every topology. And with this, we get an inverse definition of the Fourier transform of this function, which is that it's this. And again, this is uh, by definition of the Fourier-Steelchies transform. And here, 
again, this holds in the discrete topology and in any field containing uh, contain the uh, algebraic numbers. Now, the fun part is that for any prime Q, including Q equals P, the uh, Q-adic absolute value of the right-hand side is bounded. It's at most Q. The biggest, this, this is an integer, so it's going to have bounded uh, Q-adic absolute value of 1, and the worst that these can be is Q, and that occurs when P equals Q. So this formula is bounded PQ-adically, and so by the earlier work, this means this thing defines a measure. And in particular, the, our handy-dandy Parseval Plancherel formula tells us that this is then how we define the measure for any continuous PQ at F. More generally, we can do this for any rational, basically any rational exponent. And it just follows from summing this Fourier series and then rearranging. And with this, we then get the following. Let P and Q be distinct primes and let alpha be a rational number other than negative one. Then we get a we get a PQ adic measure out of this map, which is just, again it's the Parseval Plancherel formula, and uh, this then gives us and I write this how I write the measure, and here's the fun part, because this formula this formula right here holds in the discrete topology, it's again it's by pure algebra, so this is the this is the definition of this uh, uh, measure even when f is complex valued, in which case then we'll have that this thing is a tempered distribution and it works when f is a schwartz bruhat function, a locally, con locally constant complex valued function on the p-adic integers. This is then going to take us to get a p-q-adic Mellon transform, but it does even more than that. However, before I go on, I have a, I have a, 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 a vendetta, I have a vendetta or, uh, that I need to uh, voice. So in 2020, I nearly had a mental breakdown because I was trying to, like, I had to get my friends to, to calm me down. I was trying to teach myself the P attic melon transform, by which I mean the P infinity attic melon transform. To this day, I have no idea how to do it. And as far as I'm concerned, no one else does either. The closest I got was that there was, I was on a math stack exchange post and Kay Conrad was starting to explain it to me in the comments, but then he disappeared. So I'm just going to assume he doesn't know how to do it either. And what do I mean by this? I mean the multiplicative Fourier transform for, uh, uh, uh defined with ZP, uh, cross, uh, it's covered in the opening chapter of Donfeld and Hunley's uh, Automorphic Representations book. There is also some notes online, the ones that I was using back in 2020, that I will link in the descriptions. I don't understand how to do it, and it, it gets too much algebra for my brain. It talks about conductors and all this stuff, but that stuff is done non-constructively. I don't know how to find it. And in particular, I would like to know what is the p-adic uh, Mellon transform of this function right here, the indicator function of z p to the n zero. What is it? How do we compute it? What is it? Uh, what is is it written as the limit of a Riemann sum? How does this done? Please, somebody, because I've had this question. It's been up for years on Math to Stack Exchange. No one has answered it satisfactorily. And it's, again, it's I just find it abysmal that no one knows how to do. Uh, Apparently, no one you know, understands how to even a, this simple computation. I asked my uh, Sheldon. He doesn't know how to do it. It's it's just, it drives me crazy. And I really want to know, just for it, out of personal spite, I need to know how to do it. So, but in addition to that, the reason why this makes me angry, or this whole identity makes me angry, is that it gives us calculus. So, since we are doing number theory, it, was, it seems perfectly natural that we're going to talk about fractional order Sobola spaces. I kid, I kid, it isn't natural to talk about them, but we absolutely will be talking about them anyway. So, as a rule, fractional calculus is horrible. It's been around for as long as ordinary calculus has, and it's been horrible all that time. Arguably, one of the least horrible forms arises in the theory of partial differential equations in the context of fractional order Sobolev spaces. Um, so, just if you are not an, an analyst, uh, don't worry, I'll explain it to you. It's not as scary as it sounds. So let's consider some complex valued functions, u and v on R, and we're going to let u be, say, continuously uh, differentiable and compactly supported. Integration by parts then gives us the following. It's the integral of u prime v 
is equal to negative the integral of v prime u. The uh, compact support of u is what tells us that the boundary terms vanish. Even if v is not differentiable everywhere, we can use this construction to define what's known as the distributional derivative of v. This is a linear functional which accepts, say, a compactly supported smooth function u and then outputs the following integral. So that is to say it outputs negative this integral. Why is this a notion of the derivative? Well, we can basically we can use the fundamental theorem of calculus to recover the function from it in the way that we would in the normal, uh, if it was ordinarily differentiable. So what we do here is we're going to consider a family of what's known as approximate identities. This is a family of smooth functions parameterized by this parameter epsilon greater than zero with the property that the limit as epsilon decreases to zero of this integral, integral of f of x, u of epsilon x, dx, converges to the value of f at zero. And there's some other smooth, other uh, regularity conditions you need in order for it to work. But what you end up get, getting is that the convolution of f with u epsilon converges to f as epsilon tends to zero. And so using this, if v is uh, smooth, we can use this distributional derivative to recover v by writing that it's the distributional derivative of a v applied to u epsilon. If we take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, this gives us v of x. And so what this then tells us is that the derivative of a function is a linear functional which acts on other functions by integration and, inter and, in and integration by parts in particular. And, and then if the uh, distributional d d derivative is sufficiently nice, we can use uh, uh, averaging and the fundamental theorem of calculus to recover the value of the function at the points where it is nice. And so using this, you can then, by doing iterated integration by parts, you can extend this idea to distributional derivatives of arbitrary order. Uh, distributions or generalized functions, it's the idea that we have a function that may not be defined point-wise, but we can make sense out of it by continuing considering it as an, a linear functional which operates on an appropriately uh, selected uh, uh, space of test functions that behave nicely. And so it even works for derivatives of fractional order, and that's with a little bit of help from the Fourier transform. So recall that the Fourier transform turns differentiation into multiplication. The Fourier transform of f prime is negative 2 pi i c f hat of c. So if we can invert, we then get that the derivative of f is negative 2 pi i c uh, f hat's inverse Fourier transform. This suggests that we can define the alpha order fractional derivative of f as negative 2 pi i c to the power of alpha times the uh, Fourier transform of f, and then we invert Fourier transform. The Sobolev space WKP of R is defined as the set of all uh, f and lp such that their distributional derivatives for the n, for n equals 1 to k are also in lp, and this is a Banach space by defining the norm of f to be the maximum of the lp norms of f and its distributional derivatives. Fractional order Sobolev spaces, in turn, arise when we extend the LP requirements to the fractional derivatives of f. In the manner defined as above, we can realize these as, as linear functionals by multiplying and everything. So, in 1988, Vladimirov wrote an article on generalized functions over the p-adics and used it to define distributional derivatives of fractional order in a p-infinity attic context. So letting f be a continue a complex valued function on QP, which is integrable, its Fourier transform looks like this, where dx is the real valued Haar measure, normalized to be a probability measure on Zp. Then Vladimirov defined the alpha -th order fractional derivative, now known as the alpha -th order Vladimirov derivative of f, by it's the exact same thing, but instead of negative two pi i this, it's the it's uh, y to the alpha, it's p at p at absolute value, time, and it's the inverse Fourier transform of this. And so in particular, let's consider when f is 1 zp, the indicator function for zp in qp. Letting d alpha denote the alpha -th order of Vladimirov operator. It sends their functions to their, its functions to their alpha -th order derivatives. We then have, well, this is the Fourier transform over q, which is 
And it's known that the Fourier transform over QP fixes the indicator function of ZP. The indicator function of ZP is the non-archimediate, is the p-adic analog of the Gaussian curve. And so this is the indicator function of ZP applied to X. So this is an integral over ZP. And since uh, here Y is a Q-adic rational number, but because X is an integer, and a p-adic integer, and a and y is a p-adic rational, this, is, this function depends only on the fractional part of y. And this is just the Fourier transform of chi p. This is complex value, but as we saw, the formula depend, is, is, is universal. It's independent of our choice of valued field. So it's the exact same thing that we got before, which except we just replaced t with the fractional part of y. So since... Uh, uh, x is a p adic integer, the derivative depends only on the fractional part, and so this means that this procedure, although we're doing it here in the complex numbers, it works just as well if we, over any valued field f, provided that the residue of field characteristic thing works out. And so this formula is universal. And so it's, it holds true purely by algebra, independent of the field we view it as taking values in. As such, we can get PQ-adic distributional derivatives by simply copy-pasting Vladimirov's definition and changing our C-valued functions to F-valued functions. I'm still busy working out some of the details, but one of the most important is that the theory is primarily one that you have to look at when you're considering functions on QP rather than ZP, because then things get a bit degenerate. But I've already made some progress. For example, I've shown that uh, integrable functions on QP uh, are... Uh, PQ-adic integrable functions are integrable if and only if they decay at zero, if and only if they have uniformly convergent Fourier transforms. And so you can do it all together. And this, like the Volkenbohr integral stuff, it's just waiting there to be explored. There's a whole new world of analysis that we can do using this definition. We can bring in d d uh, derivatives and stuff. For example, can we use this distributional <laughs> derivative to define... Uh, 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 differential forms and whatnot and get uh, chain complexes by, by doing that. I don't know, uh, because if we could, that could then potentially give us a way of doing cohomology, and that would be useful because we could use that to extract algebraic invariants. Uh, again, there's also the question of how this interacts with the scheme-like stuff where we view Q as the variable. In that case, uh, there might be other kinds of derivatives that we could do to try and get topological, try and get uh, uh, chain complexes and, and, and cohomology out of that, but it, I don't know how to do it. Remains to be seen. But again, there's so much to be left to be done, and it's all it's the that's the fun part is that it's all still at the down to earth enough that you can make progress literally by just playing around with formulas like this. But at the same time, because of the connections to established areas of non-Archimedean analysis and harmonic analysis, you can also get quite deep into it. So in the next episode, we're going to be talking about Wiener's Tauberian theorem, and that's going to be quite fun. So see you all then.